Good morning once again. What a joy it is uh, for me to be able to share with you uh, God's word uh, this morning. Those that are joining us for the first time this month, this month we've been going through a series, Waymaker. And it's basically a series that adopts the, a biblical image in the scripture of the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea and their journey all the way uh, to the land of promise. It's that journey through the wilderness from Egypt to the promised land. And that's the image that we're using from the book of Exodus this month as we focus our attention on the way maker, the God of this journey. And we also focus our attention on the journey itself and the various things that God did, the various lessons that God taught the children of Israel as they continued on in this journey. So welcome again uh, to this series. We are now on the third sermon in the series Waymaker. We began the series uh, several Sundays ago by saying that the Israelites were actually in the right place. We serve a God that does not make any mistakes. The children of Israel were in the right place for God to perform one of the greatest miracles of all time, the parting of the Red Sea. We continued on last Sunday by looking at how God, yes, parted the Red Sea, but because Moses had the right perspective. It is that perspective that was focused and was anchored and was centered on the certainty of God and not on the uncertainty of their circumstances. And because he honored God by his faith and his obedience to God, then God parted the Red Sea and they managed to be able to cross. Today I'd like us uh, to look at the journey that now the children of Israel take after they have crossed the Red Sea, they begin a journey through the wilderness. And that's what we'll be focusing on. This journey towards the promised land. I suggest to us today that this journey actually happened in various stages. And in each and every stage that the children of Israel actually went through, God had a very specific purpose in each and every stage that they went through. There is a particular lesson that God wanted to teach the children of Israel as they continued in this journey through the land of promise. There is a way God wanted them to grow. There is a way God wanted them to mature as they continued in their journey through the land of promise. So today we are going to look at the plan that God had. We started by looking at the right place. They were in the right place. They had the right perspective, but you also need the right plan. You need to stick to God's plan as God guides us to our place of purpose and our place of destiny. And finally, next Sunday, we are going to look at the power that God displayed at the end of the journey. So those are the four lessons we're looking at in this series. Plan is what we're going to look at today, the right plan. Because to get where you need to get, to get to accomplish God's purposes in your life, you need to have the right plan. And that's what we'll be focusing our attention on today. Now this journey, this journey that we are on, this journey towards the land of promise, this journey towards God's purposes for our life unfolds one step at a time. And the children of Israel crossed several deserts on their journey to the land of promise. We know it as the vast wilderness between Egypt and the promised land, but they actually crossed various distinct deserts and various stages as they continued on in their journey. Today I'm going to use the image of the different deserts that they had to cross on their way to the promised land, and I'm going to literally draw from these deserts specific lessons that God taught the children of Israel every step of the way. These were distinct stages that God took the children of Israel on their land, on their journey to the promised land, on their journey through the wilderness. And I want to suggest to us today that God might be doing the same thing for us. In this season that we are on a journey through a wilderness, maybe God is doing the same thing in us that he did for the children of Israel. Maybe God is teaching us specific lessons every single stage of the journey. Maybe God is teaching us or growing us and maturing us in specific ways 
every step of this journey. And I suggest to us today, as we look at these deserts, would we draw from these lessons the things that God is teaching us every stage of our journey through the wilderness? The first stage I suggest to us today is the stage of hardening. This is where God took them through the desert of Etham. The second desert that they went through was the desert of Shur. And in the desert of Shur, God was teaching them literally the lesson of healing. In the third desert, the desert of sin, God was teaching them the lesson of hunger. And this is the stage where they experienced great hunger. The fourth desert they went through was the desert of Rephidim. In the desert of Rephidim, this was the stage of hazards. And God was teaching them a lesson. And finally, we look at the last desert, the desert of Sinai. The desert of Sinai is the desert of holiness. This is where God taught them the lesson of holiness. So those are the five things I'd like us to look at. In the five stages of this journey that they took through the wilderness towards God's purposes for their life, God's plan was that they experience hardening. God's plan was that they experience healing. God's plan was that they experience hunger. God's plan was that they experience hazards. And God's ultimate plan was that they encounter and experience the holiness of God. Let me very quickly refer to each of these stages as we allow you the opportunity to reflect on these stages and ask yourself, what stage am I in in my wilderness journey? We're going to be looking at literally five chapters in the book of Exodus. Last Sunday, we looked at chapter 14. We're going to pick up from chapter 14 and go on all the way to chapter 19. Because we cannot read all these chapters, I'm going to encourage you to read the chapter that is relevant to the stage that I refer to, even as we continue on in this wilderness journey. So the first stage is the stage of hardening. This is where they went through the desert of Etham. You can see it in chapter 14 um, of the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 14. The Israelites had left Egypt, and we referred to this last Sunday and the Sunday before. After they left Egypt, God took them through a desert called the desert of Etham, and they finally found themselves encamped by the Red Sea, ready for the Red, the famous Red Sea crossing. But this season that they were in was a very particular season of hardening simply because God deliberately placed in front of them an impossible situation. And remember last Sunday we said God brought to them a threat. The threat of the armies of Egypt and Pharaoh pursuing them. They were in a very tricky situation right there camped or encamped by the Red Sea after they had crossed the desert of Etham. As we continue in this COVID journey, there are many that are in that desert of Etham, the desert of hardening, the stage of hardening. The place where you are right now is where you see the Red Sea ahead of you and you see the threat of the armies of Egypt behind you. You're at a place where these armies behind you that are threatening you could even be your landlord. It could be even your employer. It could be creditors that are after you. You feel like you're under pressure. And what is before you is an impossible situation. You cannot cross it. The stage that you're in right now is the stage where God allowed the children of Israel to be. Because many times, God uses unpleasant circumstances. Because unpleasant circumstances are sometimes what God needs to both prepare us and to position us for a miracle. Unpleasant circumstances are the things that God needs and the things that God uses many times to both prepare us and to position us. Now in the past two Sundays, we've talked about being positioned, being in the right place for a miracle. Today, let me refer to this other side, being prepared by God for a miracle. Because in this desert, God was actually hardening and preparing the children of Israel for a miracle that was right before their eyes. And just to be able to communicate this point, if you got some soft clay and you got some soft wax and you placed both the clay and the wax literally under the blazing heat of the sun, these two elements will respond differently 
to the heat of the sun. They will respond very differently. Literally, the clay will begin to bake. The clay will begin to harden. The clay will begin to solidify. The clay will begin to become unyielding. It will become less soft than it is. It will become hardened. The wax on the other side will behave totally differently. The wax will begin to soften. The wax will begin to melt. It will begin to become pliable. The direct opposite of what the clay would do. These two are two different elements that we have been put under the same conditions. The issue is not the condition that they have been put under. The condition was the same. The fault is not the circumstances that they are in. The fault is the material that they are actually made of. And many times God puts us in blazing heat. Sometimes God puts us under heat and under the rays of the sun, difficult and challenging situations, specifically to allow us an opportunity for our faith to be hardened, for our faith to be solidified. Difficulties solidify our faith. And I want to encourage you today, if you're in a difficult situation, would you allow that God that has a greater, grander purpose than the circumstances that you're going through, would you allow that God, instead of melting you away, to solidify your faith even through those circumstances? God cannot force you to mature. God cannot force you to grow. Instead, what God does is he leads you into situations that allow you to grow, that allow you to mature, that allow you to harden. Situations that allow you to see your faith solidified, to see yourself anchored in him. This is a very symbolic thing that God did. Right there, when the children of Israel were right next to the Red Sea, God did a very symbolic thing. He only allowed the miracle to happen at night. God could have allowed that miracle to happen during the day. It is very symbolic that God waited for nightfall when it was darkest for him to actually do the miracle of the parting of the Red Sea for the children of Israel to actually cross. The hour of our greatest need can actually become the hour of our greatest victory. Even if it is darkest, even if it is nighttime for you, God is not a respecter of time. God uses even the most desperate situations to provide for us our greatest victories. And today, I don't know if you're in a fix and you feel as if it is the darkest hour of your life. It's the darkest situation that you have ever been in. That very hour is the hour that God could use to be able to give you your greatest victory. Because we serve a God who has a greater purpose in my pain. He desires for me to mature. He desires for me to realize that he can solidify my faith even through the pain that I'm actually going through. I want to encourage you to respond in faith. Let God harden you. Let God solidify you in this season that we're going through that is a season of great challenge. Let God first harden you before he parts your waters. And that's exactly what God did in this first stage of the journey where he hardened the children of Israel. Because God is not just interested in getting you out of Egypt. God is more interested in getting Egypt out of you and allowing God and what God wants to do in your life to become primary, not just the situations around you to change. So the first stage that the children of Israel went through is the desert of Etham. This is the stage of hardening. The second stage that they went through is the stage of healing. This happened in the next chapter of the book of Exodus in the desert of Shur. We see in Exodus chapter 15, and you can look at this story of um, you know, how the children of Israel, after they had crossed the Red Sea and come out on the other side, they walked for three entire days without finding any water. They found themselves at a place of great desperation. 
Finally, they came to a place in the desert of Shur called Mara. And in Mara, they finally found water. But just after they found water, in tasting the water, they discovered that the water was bitter. And they could not take this water. And God did a miracle in Mara. God turned the bitter waters of Mara to become sweet. And it's only then that they could be able to partake of the waters in Mara. And it's important to understand Mara literally means bitter. It means bitter. Maybe this is the stage where you're at. You're at a stage in your life, just like the children of Israel, where you are experiencing some form of bitterness. We all have bitter seasons in our life. And I want to encourage us that God has a purpose even in us having to go through those bitter waters. There are areas of our lives that are broken. There are areas of our lives that are hurting. There are areas of our lives that are wounded. There are areas of our lives that are messed up. There are areas of our lives that are hurting. There are areas of our lives that are ailing. And maybe right now you're drinking bitter waters and God is telling you, I've brought you to the stage in your life where I want to change those bitter waters to become sweet. That was God's purpose in leading them to this very stage of their lives. Mara, this stage is the stage of deep healing where God transforms that which was bitter to become sweet in your life. This is where God declared for the first time this name Jehovah Rapha. In Exodus chapter 15, he introduces himself afresh to the children of Israel as the God that is your healer. And today I want to introduce that God to you. We serve a God who is Rapha. He is the God that is your healer. I pray that this COVID season for you will be an opportunity for God to do a work of healing inside your life. Literally, let God do an open heart surgery and allow the things that are in your heart, emotional wounds that are in your heart to experience healing that only God can be able to grasp. I pray that the bitterness or the hatred or the anger or the hurt or the disappointments of the past or the failures of the past will come under the healing knife of God as he opens up your heart and then finally closes it at a place of well-being, at a place of healing. Something interesting happened in this desert of Shur. After God did that transforming work, turning the bitter waters to become sweet, God now takes the children of Israel, still in that same desert, to an oasis called the Oasis of Elim. In Elim, there were 12 springs of fresh, amazing waters that they could be able to partake. They finally experienced, in Exodus chapter 15, verse 27, they experienced their place of refreshing. Because where God is concerned, after we have released our emotional wounds to the healer, our God that is able to heal us, now God opens for us a new season, a new season of refreshing a new season that he allows us to experience fresh waters in him. After releasing that which was causing us bitterness, after releasing that which was wounding us, God now ushers us. And I suggest to us, because what started as a drought in this stage ended up at an oasis. What started as a drought ended up at a place of abundance, at a place of fulfillment. And I want to declare to you, if you allow God, Rapha, our healer, to heal your heart and to heal the wounds in your heart and to heal you at the place where you are today, you will end up from not just from, from a place of drought, but you will end up finally at a place of abundance, a place of fulfillment, a place where God would have refreshed you and renewed you. The third stage that we see the children of Israel in is the stage that I call the stage of hunger. Because in the desert of sin, in Exodus chapter 16, this desert is where the children of Israel experience God in a totally different way. The Israelites by this time in Exodus chapter 16, they had been on the road for six weeks. It has been a long journey from the time that they actually left Egypt. And many of you might imagine that the initial excitement, the joy and celebration of leaving Egypt has long gone. 
because they've been under the scorching heat, walking day and night as God allowed them to have the pillar, the pillar of fire at night and the cloud that would guide them during the day. After walking so long, they had gotten to the place where literally their awareness of God had faded off. And this is where they are right now in chapter 16. They had run out of supplies because all the things that they had carried from Egypt, all the stocks of food and supplies after six weeks had run out. And they are at a place where their supplies are dry. And they find themselves at a place of deep hunger. They don't have food. They are hungry. Six weeks into this journey. In Egypt, they say in Exodus chapter 16 verse 1, this is what the children of Israel said. They said, in Egypt, we sat and we ate pots of meat. We ate the food that we wanted. They immediately got their minds back to where the supplies that they had had come from. Their previous source of supply came to their minds. And right there, they started remembering the source of their supplies was Egypt. And that source of their supplies is not there. They had left it behind. And they were feeling bad because they were remembering the abundance in terms of food that they would experience in Egypt. But they did not know that God allowed them to go hungry. God allowed their stock to run out because God wanted to introduce them to a new source. God wanted to introduce them to a new supplier. God wanted to introduce them to a new diet. Not the diet of Egypt, but the diet of heaven. There is bread that God would now entrust to the children of Israel called manna. And this bread was the most consistent supply of food that you could ever have. It was food that comes directly from God that never runs dry. And God releases this supply to the children of Israel in the book of Exodus chapter 16. Every single morning they would find fresh bread that has been supplied by God. They would go out and gather this for themselves. For 40 years in the desert, God faithfully supplied to the children of Israel. There's something amazing that God was trying to do to the children of Israel in this stage of their journey. God was redefining their source of supply and their diet. And I suggest to us through this COVID season, maybe God is doing the same thing in us. Maybe God is removing our previous supply, drying out our previous sources so that he can introduce us to a new source, but also so that he can introduce us to a new diet. It is in this stage that we see their hunger for God becoming to grow. It begins to grow in this stage because God begins to supply to them a new meal. And I pray for you at home, right there where you are, wherever you are watching us from, that God will give you a new hunger for him this season. That you will experience a new diet, the bread of life. Not the physical bread, but the word of God will begin to nourish not your physical body, but your spiritual body. And that you will, like the children of Israel, take responsibility every morning to go out and gather this spiritual food and be able to consume the word of God. And it places you at a place of great nourishment. That you will allow God to teach you a new discipline in this season. That you will allow yourself to take responsibility to gather and eat every single day the spiritual food that God has in store for you. And just like manna, you can't live off somebody else's food. God provided food for each and every home and each and every household, each and every individual, and God has provided food for you. Just like manna, yesterday's food cannot sustain you. You have to get a fresh meal every single day from God's word and depend on his word to nourish you every single step of your journey. Today I want to ask you, which stage in this journey are you in? Are you like the children of Israel at a stage of hunger 
like they are right now? Are you like the previous stage that we're talking about, the stage of healing? Or the first stage that we talked about, the stage of hardening? The fourth stage is the desert of Rephidim. The desert of Rephidim is in Exodus chapter 17. This is the stage of hazards. This is the stage of hazards. The Israelites now arrive at a place called Rephidim, where there was absolutely no water. Remember the stage we talked about earlier on? In Mara, they found water, but the waters were bitter. In Rephidim, they did not find any water at all. And they got to the place where they started complaining bitterly. They were angry at Moses. And they went to Moses and they were literally in revolt and they were angry. How will we survive without water? Without water, we will die. And God spoke to Moses and told Moses, strike a rock. And Moses, using the rod that God had instructed him to use, he struck the rock and water gushed out of the rock. And the children of Israel experienced fresh water. But I actually don't think the most significant thing that happened in Rephidim was this water, this fresh water that God provided for them. Because Rephidim is a place of war. That's what Rephidim represents. And this is the place where the children of Israel were attacked by the Amalekites. The children of Israel go to war with the Amalekites in Exodus chapter 17. The Amalekites were famous. They were very famous as those enemies that would attack you from behind. They would wait for a time where you're weakest, where you're most vulnerable. When you least expect, the Amalekites would attack you. When you are vulnerable, when you're tired, when you're weary, they were a tribe that was known for attacking people uh, during this time. We all have Amalekites in our life journey. We all have those areas in our lives where we have weak areas, we have blind spots, we have areas in our lives where we're most vulnerable, areas in our lives where we are most susceptible. These are the Amalekites of our lives. The battle with the Amalekites lasted the entire day. And I want to encourage us not to underestimate the power of this battle, the battle with the weak areas of your life, the battle with those areas of your life where you're most susceptible. But I'd like you to also notice, beyond the battle that they had to fight their, with the Amalekites, there's a posture of victory that God instructed the children of Israel to have in this battle. The posture of victory that God asked the children of Israel to adopt was that God instructed that Moses would keep his hands up. And as long as Moses' hands were up, the children of Israel were winning the battle with the Amalekites. The minute literally Moses put down his hands, the children of Israel were losing on the battlefield. When he lifted up his hands, they were winning. When he brought down his hands, they were losing. This posture is actually a posture of surrender. This is a posture of prayer. And as long as Moses had his hands up, surrendered to God, praying, then the battle with the Amalekites was being won. And this is the same posture, the same posture of victory that God wants us to have where our weak areas are concerned, where the areas where we are vulnerable are concerned, the areas where we are susceptible. God wants us to constantly surrender our flesh to him. God wants us to constantly surrender our weak areas to him. God wants us to constantly surrender our blind spots to him our vulnerable and susceptible areas to him because it is only in that posture of surrender that we are able to call upon God for strength as we pray for God to strengthen us in the areas where we are weak. But as I mentioned earlier on, this battle took the whole day and Moses could not keep his hands up the whole day. And there came a time where Moses' hands were tired where Moses' hands were worn out and he could not keep them up the entire day. And instead, Moses had to put his hands down. But what happened is Aaron, two friends that were next to him, Aaron and Hor, noticed the significance of that posture of victory and they came and literally upheld his hands. With Aaron on one side and Hor on the other side, Moses' hands could continue in that posture of victory. 
And what I'd like to give us through this imagery is a challenge. That there are some things in your life that you cannot overcome by yourself. There are some things in your life that you need others to support you. You need others to hold you accountable. You need others to pray for you. You need others to uphold you so that your victory continues to happen and you continue to maintain that particular posture of victory. You need others. You cannot do it by yourself. And even in this COVID season, would you surround yourself with a community that can lift you up? Would you surround yourself with a community that can pray over you? Would you surround yourself with a community that can encourage you, that can support you, even as you go through the weakest time of your life? You can maintain a posture of victory because of the people that you surround yourself with. And we have communities of faith here at Nairobi Chapel that you can join. And if you do not belong to a community and you're feeling alone right now, would you just text our WhatsApp number 0701 Text that number and say, I need a spiritual community. I need people to surround me. I cannot walk alone. And God will surround you with what it needs to maintain a posture of victory over all the hazards that we're going through or that you will go through in this journey. The final stage that the children of Israel found themselves in was the desert of Sinai. This is the stage of holiness. The stage of holiness. This is ultimately the place that God had planned all along to bring the children of Israel. The, literally, the desert of Sinai had the mountain of God, Mount Sinai. God was interested in bringing the children of Israel to this place. Yes, you know that the children of Israel had left Egypt in victory and in excitement. They were happy at what God had done in delivering them from the claws of the Egyptians. We have already seen God parting the Red Sea and the children of Israel crossing over to the other side. We've seen God turning bitter waters to become sweet. We've seen God nourishing and nurturing his people using manna in the desert, helping them to overcome their hunger. We've seen God giving them victory over the Amalekites. Finally, we see God bring the, bringing them to the place where he had wanted for them to be all along, literally to the place that was part of his ultimate plan for them was to bring them to the mountain of God. Because ultimately, God wanted his people to gather around him so that he can reveal himself to them in a special and in a very powerful way. God now calls the children of Israel that were encamped around, literally around the mountain of God in Exodus chapter 19. He calls them to consecrate themselves. He tells them, sanctify yourself. Come, because I want to meet with you. I want to commune with you. I want to develop a relationship with you. I want to move deeper and deeper in my relationship with you and develop a level of intimacy with you because that's what God ultimately wants. He wants us to worship him and to experience him in a deep and an intimate relationship with him. Sinai is the place where God's presence and God's power intersect. This is the presence where this is the place where we encounter God's presence in a new and in a fresh way because God ultimately desires to reveal himself to his people. This is God's greatest desire for you, God's greatest desire for us. And that's why this is the place in the entire journey. This is the place where the children of Israel lingered longest. This is where they stayed longest because God desired to commune with them for them to encounter him afresh and to encounter him in a personal way. And when we're in the presence of God, God does not want us to hurry. God does not want us to hurry. He wants us to linger. He wants us to experience what it is to be in his presence. That's where they stayed longest. But this is also where God revealed himself most to the children of Israel. In his presence is where God reveals himself to us most at his feet at the foot of the mountain of god 
It's at the foot of the mountain of God that Moses was entrusted the laws of God. And he brought these laws to the children of Israel. This is where the feasts were established. This is where God instructed the children of Israel of how to build a tabernacle, a dwelling place for God to be able to live among them and to continue to commune with them. This stage is much deeper than just an experience. This stage is a place where God ushers you and I to a new life with him. He ushers you and I to open a new chapter with him in our engagement and in our fellowship with him. A new lifestyle of worship, an intimate relationship with him. And it's in this season that God reveals himself most to the children of Israel. Is this what God wants to do with you during this COVID season? To reveal himself to you like he has never revealed himself to you before. Would you just make a commitment to make dwelling in the presence of God the most important part of this season for your life? And would you give God the opportunity to show up in your life like he has never showed up before? What happened in Sinai changed everything. It changed everything about them. It changed everything about their God because God dwelt among them and did something in their lives that was unprecedented. What happens in this COVID season may change everything for you, may change everything where your relationship with God is concerned. But I just want to bring to attention that there's something unfortunate that happened also, literally at this same mountain. This is the place where the greatest rebellion happened, where the children of Israel rebelled against God most. Their greatest rebellion came just before their greatest revelation. And we see this happening in this passage. Moses is on the mountain of God. He comes down, and because he had stayed for too long on the mountain of God, the children of Israel that were in the valley and let me put it this way, the valley of their fears. Because they were fearing, is Moses going to come back? Is Moses coming back ever? Has Moses disappeared? Has Moses abandoned us? And because the children of Israel were in the valley of their fears, what they did is they allowed their fears to control them to the place where they started erecting other gods to worship other than the one and only true God. Be careful in this stage because sometimes you can allow the fears that you have to control you and you can begin to worship other things other than God in this season yet God desires you to worship him beyond and above every other thing he wants you to worship him but too many times we find ourselves worshiping other things because each of us wants something to worship I don't know if today you're worshiping your fears I don't know if you're worshipping your fame. I don't know if you're worshipping your job. I don't know if you're worshipping your networks. I don't know if you're worshipping your wealth because you're in a place of fear and you're in a place where ultimately you need something to worship. I want to encourage you to turn your entire worship to the one and only true God and let that place where you potentially could have rebelled become the place where God reveals himself most in your life and in my life. Even in the middle of this COVID season, you may be at your Sinai. I want to challenge you to turn your entire worship to the one and only true God and let God reveal himself in your life. God's intention all along, all along, God's plan all along, God's ultimate purpose all along was to bring the children of Israel to himself was to bring you and I to himself closer and closer to an intimate, powerful encounter with him that ultimately would result in an ongoing, day-to-day, intimate journey with God for the rest of your life. And that's God's intention. And maybe this season, God is trying to catch your attention. God is hoping that you'd start a relationship with him. God is hoping that you would begin a journey with him ahead of you and let him lead you for the rest of your life. I don't know what stage that you're in today, in your spiritual journey. I don't know what it is 
that you're struggling with right now, wherever you are, at your home, wherever it is that you're worshiping with us this morning. I don't know where you are in your journey. What I know is God has a plan. God has a purpose for you. I don't know if you're in the stage of hardening where you're facing one of your greatest challenges. Impossibilities lie ahead of you. And God is just using that to solidify your faith. Would you allow God in this COVID season to solidify your faith, to anchor you, to harden you even in this stage? I don't know if you're in the stage of healing where there are many bitter things in your life that God's intention is to turn the bitter things to become sweet. For God to reveal himself as Rapha in your life, the God that is able to heal. I don't know if you're in the stage of hunger where God has dried up your supply and intentionally done so so that he can introduce you to a new supply. He can introduce you to a new diet, the diet of the word of God. I don't know if you're in the season of hazards where you're feeling as if the weak areas of your life, the mistakes of your life, your past, and all those weaknesses are coming and attacking you. You're feeling vulnerable. And maybe God just wants you to get a loving faith community around you so that you can have the posture of victory as Moses did, the posture of surrender, the posture of prayer. To surrender those weak areas, those shortcomings to him and let God have his way. I don't know if you're in the place of holiness, that stage of holiness, the final stage in this journey where God just wants you to enjoy his presence. God just wants you to put aside every other God and every other thing that you could turn to and just focus on him and enjoy his presence because he doesn't want you to rush. He wants you to linger there and enjoy and encounter him afresh in this season. My prayer is whatever stage that you're in, that you would allow God's ultimate purpose to prevail in your life. Shall we pray together? So Father, thank you for the opportunity to hear your word and to let your word find its rightful place in our lives. And I just want to come before you right now and uphold your people at whatever stage they're in in their journey. We serve a God that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we've thought, asked, or imagined. So I pray for us, whatever stage that we're in, that would you accomplish in us what you have desired to accomplish in us. Lord, let your glory be seen. Father, I pray that for those that need to be hardened, would you allow us, O oh God, to be willing to let God solidify our faith. Those that need healing, would you stretch out your hand and become rougher in their lives right now and heal them and restore them and bring them to that place of spring. Bring them to that place where they can enjoy new waters. Father, if there's somebody here that is in the place of hazards, Father, would you allow them, oh God, to surrender and adopt that posture of victory before you, to surrender themselves totally and completely to a God that loves them, even in spite of each and every circumstance that they have been in. Father, if someone here is in a place of hunger and God is simply stripping away from them, their misplaced source of supply and instead God is giving them a new diet, would they make a commitment today, O oh God, to submit to the word of God, to submit themselves to this new diet of the word of God that is able to nourish them forever. But Father, for all of us, your ultimate plan is for us to come to the mountain of God, for us to come to the place where we enjoy the presence of God, for us to come to the place where we worship God in spirit and in truth. May that be the ultimate outcome of this COVID season, that you bring people to worship at your feet and exalt you and magnify you. So Father, we thank you for all that you're doing. And as we continue in this journey, this journey that is ahead of us, we confess that you are our way maker and that you will guide us and lead us through this journey. For we pray this believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I want to ask us, uh, to literally text or call that WhatsApp number. If you're responding to anything that God has spoken to you uh, today, we have pastors that are waiting to be able uh, to hear from you. So thank you once again, and you're invited to continue with us next week as we conclude this series. God bless you.